start of these new national guidelines, which will be launched on uh, Thursday. Uh, they're designed to help clinicians to manage patients with prolonged disorders of consciousness. Now, these patients have usually had a catastrophic brain injury, and they're hovering somewhere between coma and consciousness. They may be awake, but totally unaware, either of themselves or things around them, such as um, those people within a vegetative state, um, or they may be minimally aware, as in a minimally conscious state. So the research that was done at Cardiff and York University involved in-depth interviews with 51 family members looking at their experience of decision making and we were able to bring that to bear alongside the extensive clinical experience on the working party. What our research found was that families often lacked information and support. They did not know what their role was in decision making about medical treatment. Many of them believed that as next of kin they could make the decision themselves. And indeed, if you watch the American medical dramas, you'll see it's always next of kin making the decision. So it's not surprising that many of us misunderstand our role. Next of kin have no legal decision-making powers for another adult in the family. Uh, they did not know how to protect their own wishes if they were ever in the, this situation themselves. And often family members that we interviewed expressed very strong wishes about, well, if it was me, what I would want. There was often no clear information from clinicians about how decisions were taken. And it seemed that in some cases, patients' prior expressed wishes were not being factored into decision making. And also that families were feeling burdened by decisions that were not theirs to make. But in fact, as Liz pointed out, um, next of kin are not the decision maker. It's clinicians' responsibility in most cases, um, unless the family member has, prior to the accident, been appointed as lasting part power of attorney health and welfare, not to be confused with LPA finance, um, or the person, prior to the injury, has written a advanced decision to refuse treatment, and that has to be in a certain written form with signatures. Um, or, after an accident, it's just possible you can get a welfare deputy ship for health and welfare appointed by the Court of Protection. So what we did to address this in the guidelines is threefold. Firstly, information about the Mental Capacity Act is threaded throughout the guidelines for clinicians. Secondly, we've included a supplement which has a template advanced decision to refuse treatment for people who want to record wishes in a legally binding form about what they would want in such circumstances. And of course, no one can demand treatment, but we are all, if we have capacity, empowered to either accept or refuse treatment, but you lose that right once you lose capacity, unless you've taken action to protect it. And then finally, we produced a leaflet on the role of family and friends, which is both for families and for clinicians, guiding them through some of the concerns families have raised, why this can be so challenging um, for families and clinicians, and suggesting processes that can help. Where you phrase that question about they don't want to contemplate it is very, very important because there are some families that we interviewed who said, I don't want to contemplate it, but he wouldn't want to live like this. And if the doctors would take responsibility, that would be a relief. Now, there were other families who said, I don't want to contemplate it, and his values and beliefs, or her values and beliefs, were such that she would want life at any cost and all intervention. And it's important to draw the distinction there, and then it's up to a court to decide to take, yes, I do think it's about taking a burden, and they will take into account the patient's wishes. And that bypasses, in a way, that very complex psychological position that families are put in. None of us want to decide to give up on someone we love. But some of us might want to fight for that person's own wishes to be respected, in whichever direction that is. And I think that's the important distinction here. And families need support and a framework to enable the patient's best interests and their wishes to be taken into account in a best interest decision. Yeah. And that has been the law since 2007, mm. and a lot of families have been left in limbo without any structure, and in a lot of pain and difficulty, so I welcome the fact that these put the Mental Capacity Act in the best interest of patients at the forefront and ask the organisations and the professionals who, after all, every family is encountering this 
we hope, only once, <laughs> and for the first time, although. Um, and if we've got a clear pathway and structure and guidance, I think that's for the good for both for clinicians and for patients and for their families. One of the cruelest things you can do to a relative is say in passing to them, if I'm ever a vegetable, switch me off. It, that's not a legally binding instruction. It's not helpful when the family's in this situation, but it's what lots of people do do. And then that's awful for the family member who's left behind trying to work out what you would want and to ensure you get it. So I would say that either giving someone you trust the lasting power of attorney health and welfare is one way of trying to ensure they can speak on your behalf. But an advanced decision above all is it's really a gift um, to give to the people who might be faced with this situation. Um, we did in our Cardiff York University research have one person where the injured party did have an advanced decision because unfortunately it was the second time this family had gone through something like this and their reaction to the first time was we're all writing advanced decisions. And um, that patient did have um, artificial nutrition and, and <sighs> fluid withdrawn and the interviewee said the fact that he'd written down what he wrote, that he wouldn't want to be kept alive in a severely brain injured state, helped you cope with it in your head, because otherwise it would feel like more it was your decision. So for her, that was very, very precious that she had it in writing.